Welcome to the single pilot resource management course called error management. Now we call this what if. What if? Scary things that happen in airplanes and why? This picture actually was taken by my father who used to own Jersey City Airport back in the dark ages and this was a common occurrence on landing. Now accidents happen because of mechanical problems, flying into deteriorating weather, optical illusions, poor judgment, pilot distraction, the lack of skill for conditions, and ignoring the warning signs. We're going to start out by talking about a fairly well publicized crash of a Gulf Stream on approach into Aspen. Uh, they, they committed CFIT, controlled flight into terrain, and they tried to land at Aspen, Colorado at night, flying below minimums without the runway in sight, and all aboard died. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you a little bit of the transcript of uh, the voice recorder so you can sort of give an idea of uh, what happened. And while I'm doing this, think about what you would have done, whether you're in a multi-crew airplane or even by yourself flying as a single pilot. The um, Aidit's Information Hotel was based on the 1753 local weather observation and it stated that the wind was from 030 at 4 knots, which is a slight tailwind because going into Aspen you go out toward the mountains and you come, uh, you uh, go in toward the mountains and you take off going the other way. So it's basically uh, one runway and you have to just be careful of where the wind's coming from at that time. You can't choose. Uh, visibility was 10 miles, sky condition was scattered clouds at 2,000 feet, with a ceiling of 5,500 feet broken and 9,000 feet broken. Now if you're in uh, the mountains and it's winter and you have broken ceilings like that, what would you expect? Snow showers, correct? It's going to be almost dark when they shot the approach. Now the um, Going into Aspen, if you are not an approved flight crew, mostly with the airlines that go in there, you are not allowed to shoot this approach at night. So this flight crew was going in there and if they didn't get in before dark, they were going to be illegal. The weather had deteriorated because a challenger on the approach ahead of the mist. That was another clue they should have had that maybe things weren't going to work out like they thought. About 1837, the first officer called for an approach briefing. Now they initiated the VOR DME to 15 and we'll show you that on the next slide. The captain then stated, we're probably going to make it a visual. If we don't get the airport over here, we'll go ahead and shoot that approach and we're not going to have a bunch of extra gas, so we only get to shoot it once and then we're going to rifle, which was their alternate. While the airplane was descending into the terminal area, the cockpit voice recorder recorded the flight crew discussing the location of a highway near the airport. About 1845, the captain stated, where's that highway? Can we get down in there? About 11 seconds later, the captain stated, can you see? And the first officer said, I'm looking, I'm looking, nope. About 1846, the captain indicated, I got it. And about two seconds later, he asked the first officer, can't really see up there, can you? The first officer replied over the next several seconds, nope, not really, and I, I see a river but I don't see nothing else. About 1847, the first officer stated, I see some towns over here and the highway is leading that way, but I'm not sure. When they were further down the approach, close to the runway and well below the tops of the mountains about 1901, the captain stated, where's it at? The co cockpit voice recorder recorded the first officer's 700 and 600 foot call outs. About 1902, the first officer stated, to the right which the captain repeated about one second later and radar data indicated actually that the airport was still to the left of the airplane. The aircraft crashed shortly after with engines at increased power and in a 40 degree left bank. Obviously at the last minute they realized what was going on but it was too late. Now there's a hill off the end of that runway which you sort of have to do a little dog leg when it's VFR to go around um, and that's the hill that they did hit. So you gotta ask yourself what would you have done? Why did a perfectly competent crew with a $13 million airplane end up crashing on an approach? Now if you look at the next slide, you'll see the two approaches. Okay, this one is the VOR DME. All right? It takes you 
from Red Table down the approach in two step down stages. All right? And the minimums here say 10,200 feet. All right? That's what it's supposed to, you're supposed to stay at. Now, the visual approach shows you coming over Red Table and you have to follow certain directions. You have to look for the river and you have to follow the river around the, around the side of the mountains and come down. And they say that the approach is 12,500 feet is recommended altitude for that, which is higher than the VOR DME. So here they are, sort of on a VOR DME, but sort of on a, uh, a visual. And they really weren't on either one. And the big thing is, is that they didn't establish the minimums. They didn't go by the approach minimums. They didn't go by the visual minimums. They went down too low, and obviously, you know, they control flight into terrain. So you have to say, ask yourself, well, what's going on with these, pro these pilots? You know, did they um, not talk to each other? Did they not have a plan before they got to this point? Now, they were running low on fuel. Why would you uh, shoot an approach into marginal conditions at night when you knew that if you'd have only one chance to make a missed approach? Now, the missed approach on the VOR DME is a right turn and follow the back course out so you don't hit the mountains over here. They could have done that when they got to minimums if they didn't see the airport, which they didn't do. They continued on down assuming that they could find it. Um, they could have been fatigued, they could have ended up being pressured by the passengers to get in there, but there's a lot of things that we're talking about in error management. You have to see a chain of events. You have to coordinate and talk to each other, have good cockpit resource management. If you are the only pilot in this airplane, you have to go in and say, okay, I'm looking at the approach. Which one am I going to choose? Am I going to try to get in there before dark? Somebody missed approach, chances are I might not see the air airport. So therefore, I'm only going to go as low as it says on the VOR DME and I'm going to do a missed approach if I don't see it. Or you can say more prudently is, look, the weather's kind of crummy. Um, it's getting close to dark. We might be illegal. Tell the passengers, look, we're going to have to go to, to another airport and go in in the morning because we're going to be illegal. It's too late. We just can't get in there. You have to get in the car and drive down. You have to assert your authority because you want to make sure that it's a safe flight and that's the responsibility that you have. So you have to pre-plan even if you're only a single pilot. Okay, uh, here's a mechanical problems checklist. If you have um, any problems in the airplane and you didn't check them before you took off, it's your own fault, okay? Did you check the fuel quantity visually? Is the gas cap on tight? It's really disconcerting when you're flying along and all of a sudden you see fuel siphoning out of the, the um, wing. Did you check the oil? Did you do a proper pre-flight? Not kick the tires and go, but a real proper pre-flight. Remember, this is your life you're talking about. What about weight and balance? You may think it's a mechanical when it's just too heavy. Um, we'll show you a little slide about what happened to that down the road here. Who flew it before you? Ask them about any problems. If you rent an airplane, and we've said this in other modules, if you rent an airplane or you're, you're in a club, ask the pilots before if they forgot to write something up, if everything worked fine, if there were any little glitches. You want to know before you get in the airplane what you're going to be facing. Now, practice mechanical failure emergencies. You know, you should go out and do that every once in a while. Either that or go find a simulator and do it in the simulator. You need to have this automatic when something happens. And know your procedures for an engine out landing. What if the engine quits? Okay, this plane was about 150 feet in the air when the engine quit. The pilot tried to turn around to land, but he didn't quite make it. Now, luckily, he didn't die because this was also well publicized. He landed in a whole field of porta potties. So he, he was okay, but the cardinal rule is do not turn around unless you have a lot of room. When was the last time you practiced an engine out? Now don't do this close to the ground. Go up to um, you know 3,000 feet, 5,000 feet, whatever you're comfortable with, and put the airplane in a climb uh, as if it was a departure climb. Cut, pull the, the power back like right away and then see how long it takes you to bleed off that airspeed. If it, if you'll be surprised, the stall comes up pretty quickly. So the first thing that happens if you have an engine failure, get that nose over. 
Get yourself a proper gliding speed. And then see how long it takes you to do a 180 degree turn. And pretty much it's going to be more than a 180 degree turn because you have to come S turn back to line up with the runway. See how much altitude you lose. That way you will know exactly what altitude you need to be at on takeoff before you can safely make a 180 degree maneuver. Even in a twin, people say, I have two engines. Yep. But if you have one engine pushing and the other engine not, you can end up doing a spiral. So you have to be very, very careful. Even in a twin, use it exactly the same. What if you ran out of gas? That could spoil your day. This pilot, nice, very expensive King Air, you know, and <laughs> ran out of gas. Now he was only going around for a maintenance flight. He didn't think he needed much gas. Two miles, three miles from the scene, the uh, witnesses said the uh, the right engine was feathering, was spinning very slowly. Yeah, he could, he ran out of gas. They only had a half a gallon of fuel in the tank when it crashed. Now, this is an expensive airplane. You better believe that pilot got fired. The, uh, the thing is, is, even if you are only going around for a short time, think of the fact there could be something wrong. Someone could crash on the runway. Someone could run off the runway. A fuel truck. There could be birds. There could be deer. Something to, to tell you that you had to go and hang out for a while before you came back. If you didn't have enough fuel, you're going to end up like this. So no excuse for anybody running out of fuel. Right. This was a, a very interesting um, scenario. There is a Republic RC-3 amphibian and the pilot went uh, and landed. He had his instructor with him and they went and had to Burley Idaho Airport which is a little higher elevation airport and uh, the student pilot and the instructor went out to breakfast and they told the uh, FBO to put in 30 gallons of fuel. Well, when they got back, they found out they were given 67.7 gallons of fuel. So the student pilot said, you know, we might be heavy. It's high and it's hot today. Do you think we ought to defuel? And the instructor said, nah, we'll be okay. Right? Density altitude is 5581. Temperature, 19 degrees C. That's getting up there, you know. And what happened was they took off. And as they were, the airplane climbed to 100 feet and stopped climbing. And the, uh, the student pilot said, he told the instructor, gee, it doesn't seem like it's climbing very well. And the instructor verified all the throttle, the mixture, the props were up and everything, and the airplane wasn't going anywhere. And then they flew over a set of trees, and the airplane started settling, and they hit uh, power lines. And this is what happened. If you look at this, a poor, beautiful airplane, and the next slide, <laughs> pile of a junk. All right, this didn't have to happen. You know, err on the side of caution. What you have to do is, we started out this whole seminar by saying, what if? Ask yourself in the beginning, what if? What if it's hot? What if it's high, high altitude? What if we weren't supposed to get uh, all that fuel? What if it doesn't climb? Err on the side of caution. Take the fuel out. Make sure you've got your numbers. Go back to the weight and balance and do your paperwork. Weather basics. There's another good what if. Weather always wins, right? When you're confronting it, not always, but most of the time. It's a really good opponent. Don't wait until you're scared to turn back. Because when you're scared, you're not thinking properly and your options are being diminished. So you really have to pre-plan what you're going to do if the weather starts going downhill. Even if you have an instrument rating, you need to be current proficient. You know, you don't want to go busting through a lot of low ceilings and trying to shoot approaches when you haven't made one in the last three months. Most CFIT accidents happen in marginal visibility or in the clouds, you know, on approach or on takeoff, spatial disorientation. And we always say getting there is not as important as staying alive. Now, complacency kills. I can fly in that weather. Oh, it's not a big deal. You know, it's okay. The thunderstorms are going to go away. You know, the fog's not going to be there when I get there. And then you're up there and you're in a sucker hole and you're, you know, having a lot of problems and Mother Nature is sitting there and laughing at you. Pre-planning, ask what if all the time. What if I get up there? 
what if the weather closes in? What if my destination weather goes downhill? Do I have enough fuel to go somewhere else? What's the weather at that other airport? Very important, pre-plan. Okay, here, here's a, another airplane that um, obviously killed the pilot and the co-pilot. And this guy took off into low clouds and snow. Now, do you see any de-icing equipment on this airplane? Very few single engine airplanes have de-icing equipment. Why would you take off into low clouds and snow? You don't know if there's icing in the clouds. He said it was IFR certified. Well, evidently something happened and he stopped flying. Now the little toddler in the back seat, she lived, but she asked for her teddy bear and wouldn't get out of the airplane until they found it for her. Here's another one, take off VFR into fog. <laughs> Hello, you don't go VFR into fog, first of all. Did he ask, what if I got 100 feet in the air and all of a sudden, poof, you know, I'm enveloped in white. So he was uh, scud running really low and finally, you know, decided to ditch in a garden and I'm sure the homeowner wasn't too happy, but never asked what if the ceiling is lower than I think. Always pre-plan. Now here's another one, mountains don't forget. Try, uh, Piper Cherokee tried to scud run over the mountains in Hawaii. Now you don't see the crash, but you see the mountains. Why would you scud run in these mountains? I mean, first of all, if you crash, it's going to be a long way before you can get out of there, even if you did survive. But why would you scud run when there's granite in the way? Very, very foolish. They didn't ask themselves, what if when I was scud running, I'm down the wrong canyon? There's a mountain in the way? Again, ask yourself a lot of questions before you go in a situation like this and don't do anything stupid. Now what if you're complacent? This is one of my favorite um, uh, crashes because I used to fly a hawker and this uh, flight crew made some really stupid decisions and they were very complacent all the way out to the, uh, the crash site. Okay, here's a picture of the flight path. If you notice, from Atlantic City all the way to uh, KOWA, no clouds. It was fine. They had two and a half hours to sit there and contemplate what was going to happen at the end. So what happened is they got out there and um, you know they decided for some unknown reason, instead of hanging out, waiting, going to an alternate, they decided to fly through this big cluster area of thunderstorms. It was very, very turbulent there. The winds were gusting a, a, on a tailwind before they got to that airport and they were getting thrown around a lot. So the turbulence, the desire to get there, whether they had passenger pressure, it had been raining pretty good at the airport. When they finally broke out and landed, um, they landed with only a four, four knot wind. It wasn't a lot of wind, but the winds at altitude had been coming as a downwind. So they probably had a little bit of extra speed and, and when they touched down. It was raining. Uh, had been raining and the runway was wet and in Hawker when you land a Hawker you uh, put it in put the flaps to 75 which is lift dump which prevents you from flying gets you, it adds drag put it in reverse stomp on the brakes and hope you stop well somewhere down the runway these guys made a decision that they weren't going to stop so they decided to go around well there's a, a fail safe device on the, uh, the hawker that says that you have to do things, you have to take the airplane out of reverse and take the flaps up in a specific sequence. If you don't, the flaps won't come up. Well, they screwed it up and the flaps didn't come up so they ran off the runway at 130 knots. And they turned into confetti. Unfortunately, everybody died in this airplane and um, it was an accident that didn't have to happen. What um, the NTSB determined, the probable cause, was the pilot's decision to attempt to go around late in the landing roll with insufficient runway re remaining and contributing to the accident with the pilot's poor crew coordination of cockpit discipline, fatigue, which likely impaired both pilots' performance, and the failure of the FAA to require crew resource management training and standard operating procedures for this 135 flight. Now, what we're telling people is all the way across the country, they could have done some calculations. They could have gone to the books and said, okay, once they found out the weather was going to be cruddy when they got there, they could have gone to the books and seen 
how much runway they had at their weight um, with a tailwind, without a tailwind, do some of the numbers to see if they could effectively stop on a run, wet runway. They did not do this. They determined after doing all the performance calculations that this airplane would have stopped 200 feet from the end. Now that might have been a little pucker power because you didn't think you were going to stop, but it's a lot better to run off the, air, the end of the runway at uh, 20 to 30 knots than it is 130 knots and kill everybody. So this is what I mean. All the way out. Why didn't they say, what if? What if the weather's going to be crummy? What if the runway's going to be wet? At our, at our weight, do you think we're going to be able to stop in time? You know, you've got to start asking your questions. And if you're the only pilot on the airplane and you're, you've got a long flight like that, ask yourself some questions along the way. You know, you're going to get bored anyway, so you might as well get yourself sharp and start looking ahead at the destination and finding out what the available procedures are and uh, making sure that everything is going to come out okay for you. And here is just a review of what we just said. Um, and we say what they could have done prior to this landing to assure a mistake like this would never, never have happened. And what we say is what if? Do the calculations. Do the calculations. Look at the weather. 15 minutes later it cleared. Couldn't you wait? Couldn't you go around? Couldn't you go to another airport? You know, I mean, they had plenty of time to figure this out, and they never even thought of it. Now, this is the end of part one. Please take a break and then return to part two for the rest of uh, this segment. Welcome back to part two of error management. What if? What if? Your eyes tricked you. Now, an IFR pilot um, needs to trust their instruments. But at some point, you have to see the ground to land. So if your frame of reference changes, you may not be able to interpret your visual information correctly. And this will cause confusion, probably landing long, short, or elsewhere. Now, this Pilatus came out of the fog after trying to shoot an approach and really was a little bit down the runway and instead of going around, decided to try to make it. Well, you don't see it exactly in this picture, but his nose is stuck in a fence. So he went off the end of the runway and then he just kept going and boom, he got stopped by a fence. Um, there was very little coordination in talking about, uh, you know, talking about what he would do if he couldn't see the runway, if he was too far down the runway, no missed approach procedures. I mean, evidently, he, I'd heard he had tried a couple of other approaches at other airports and he was anxious to get on the ground. But the thing is, there was, there was very little what if, obviously, because as soon as he got down there, he said, I'm getting on the ground, I don't care what happens, and didn't realize that he may not have enough room to stop. So you have to ask yourself this, you have to plan what you're going to do, and you have to make a decision that, okay, if we're third down the runway, we know we can't stop, we're out of here, we're going around. Okay, here's an upslope runway illusion. This is the kind of stuff that you may encounter. Um, it's just put in here because you may ask yourself, um, I'm going into a strange airport, you know, especially in the mountains, is it upslope or downslope? If it's upslope, it may produce the illusion of a high altitude final approach, causing the pilot to pitch down eh, with not so nice results. On the other hand, if you have a downslope runway, it's going to give you the illusion of a low final approach, causing the pilot to increase pitch and possibly stall the airplane. Now, if you're a fat runway, suppose you're, you're at an airport that's, you know, a little country airport and it's real skinny, and then you go down to um, JFK. JFK's got runways that you could probably take off across. But if you're going to land, in, especially in lower visibility, you may have the illusion of being too low, and you may have the same thing, a pitch up and a stall. The black hole is one of my favorites, um, something that... I keep advising people not to go into if there's no Vossi. Uh, we did this in a Sabre liner one time out in the Midwest and I, it, it scared the bejesus out of us because we had not a, a clue. There was no lights, there was no town, there was no horizon, there was no Vossi. It's really, really difficult to try to figure out where that runway is. 
So here we go. What if? What if there's no visual thing? You're coming in there and this is all you see. You might as well be landing on an aircraft carrier. So if you um, lower your nose, you may land short of the runway. It's very, very difficult. So at night, ask yourself, what if there's no VASI? If there's no um, situation, you know, no awareness of any other lights around there, give yourself an out and go somewhere else that has either an ILS or a, uh, a VASI. And what if the runway went away? Um, this awesome pilot tried to land on a country airstrip and upon touchdown found out he was landing three feet of snow without skis. Now, wouldn't you think that you would call ahead to find out if they plowed the runway? And if, if you came down there and looked and saw this, all this fresh snow, why would you land there? You know, you don't ask what if. How many of you, if you're going into a, uh, an airport somewhere else, find out that you get there and you need to have fuel and they just ran out of fuel? Better call ahead, find out the conditions of the airport, find out if anybody's there, find out if they have fuel, you know, just like you're going to call ahead and find out if they have food. You have to know the conditions of the airport you're going after. And you say, what if? What if I got there and there is no fuel? Do you have enough fuel to go somewhere else to get fuel? Okay, poor ju judgment. <laughs> you betcha. Um, we say with that last slide, didn't he ask about the runway conditions? All right, you also have to look at the short runway, whether it's mountainous, sloping, crosswinds, no fuel. Please ask yourself what if and analyze the airport that you're going to, especially if it's a strange airport. A judgment. What's more important? Completing the mission, saving face with your passengers, proving you aren't afraid of the conditions, showing others that you're a top gun, or staying alive. It's, um, this, is, this is a real big thing, you know, attitude, and ego play a big part in, in uh, being a pilot. Um, you don't want to turn down a trip, especially if you're, you know, you've got family or friends there, or even people that think you're God because you're a pilot. You don't want to say, "Look, I'm scared. I can't go. The winds are too strong." You know, you don't. You got to think about the money, whether you're going to, you know, ding something. Um, there's no flight that has to be completed at the cost of crashing the airplane, scaring your passengers, or scaring yourself. Now this is a professional pilot who's flying a caravan. I, we've got these things, these pilots just want to make confetti out of their airplanes. We can't understand this. <clears throat> but what happened to her was she was, um, she was a uh, professional pilot, pilot and she was flying on a freight leg. And the conditions had moderate icing reported. Her aircraft was only certified into light icing. She was overweight for the icing conditions as per the flight manual. The dispatch dispatched her you know, in an overweight condition. Whether she checked that weight and balance or whether dispatch did and just said that he didn't care, we don't know. But she lost into this miserable weather and shortly after takeoff, she cried for help to stun her. Now they did give her a vector back to the airport, but she stalled in the turn and became confetti. Um, we don't know if uh, company pressure was a contributing factor, if it was complacency, you know, you fly in this weather all the time, day after day, night after night as a, as a freight pilot and you just sort of get complacent about it. Or was it ego? She couldn't say, I'm scared or I don't think the conditions are good, I don't want to go. All right? This is another thing where you're on the ground, even if you're a professional pilot. Sit there and say, what if? Check and check and check again and again and again. What if I'm too heavy? Let me look at the numbers again. Let me see what this is. Let me check the weather again. How bad is the icing? If I do get a load of ice, am I going to have time to break it off? And is it going to affect me based on my weight? You have to ask these questions before you leave the ground. Do you know that good pilots aren't afraid to cancel a flight? Ask yourself, is your reason for flying today for fun? or for business, for maintaining proficiency, or for training. After analyzing all the parameters necessary, this is we cover a lot of this in our risk management seminar, are you convinced you will have an uneventful flight? If you're apprehensive at all, you know, trust your gut. If you think that the weather might be a little dicey, if you're not sure that um, the run-up didn't go good, and you, you sit there, oh, maybe I ought to go back to maintenance and see if they can find out why this thing is, is coughing so much. Passenger pressure is a really big one. Um, traffic, you know, think. Do you need to fly that day? 
Flying is a, is a privilege and it's a responsibility and you have to sit there and not think of it as a car. You have to think of it as, some, as, as a responsibility you have to have to make sure that not only you get there safe but your airplane doesn't get damaged and your passengers live. Like we said, airplanes aren't cars. They all have steering columns, radios, GPS, heaters, adjustable seats, and they cost money when they break down. Airplanes cost more money than cars when they break down. But we also can't pull over if something goes wrong with our airplane in the air. And we can be bad drivers and survive, but if we're bad pilots, you're going to have a very expensive day. And good judgment is exactly what the difference is. And that takes discipline. You have to constantly ask yourself, what if? What am I fit to fly? Is my airplane mechanically fit to fly? Can I handle the conditions that I'm going to fly into? What if? Um, this was a very publicized flight, okay? Working on your laptop and the airplane can get you fired. Um, Nor Northwest pilots working on their schedules on their laptops in the cockpit overflew Minneapolis by 150 miles, almost scrambled interceptor aircraft, and um, the flight attendant finally knocked on the door and said, I think we passed the airport back there. So obviously, you know, they got into major trouble, but they didn't talk to anybody for 77 minutes. How can you not talk to anybody? How can you not hear your call sign? Are you so complacent that the airplane does not become a professional environment, whether you're a single pilot or in a flight crew? That airplane is, is your responsibility. You have to fly as if you are professional at all times. Obviously, these guys didn't do it. How many people fly their airplane, listen to music, chit chat, you know, do other stuff when you're on autopilot flying around? But you still have to have to pay attention to what you're doing. You should re my um, advice is if you're flying the airplane, fly the airplane. All right, that's it. That's your one responsibility if you want to get it on the ground. And it's more fun when you do that because you're flying. If you don't want to fly the airplane, if you want to work on your laptop, drive. You know, go someplace, sit in a park, you know, but uh, when you're flying an airplane, don't get distracted. Constantly ask yourself, what if? If they had, you know, they say, you know, every, every 10 minutes they would have said, um, what, what if we're missing a call? Maybe we ought to stop talking and we ought to pay attention or one of us ought to pay attention. Okay, other uh, more normal distractions that can cause flight upset are chatting with passengers. Sometimes you just have to tell passengers, sterile cockpit working with handheld GPS's or working your panel mounted GPS's. This is a big distraction, right? Uh, it, it, the GPS takes a lot of concentration and if it, you can't get it to do what you want it to do, things can go to hell in a handbasket because you're not flying the airplane while you're trying to figure this, this electronics out. Looking at stuff on the ground while flying in marginal conditions, this can give you spatial disorientation. So unless you're a really good instrument pilot, you know, and if you start getting that, go right to the instruments, be careful. If you grab something from the back seat, which is uh, basically what killed John Denver, you know, when he reached back to um, try to get the, um, the, the fuel selector, which we're going to talk about in a minute, um, this could cause a distraction. Electronics failure. Um, worrying about the weather, personal or business crisis, getting there on time, having to go to the bathroom. We had uh, one time I was flying a, uh, a Baron. Um, I was getting checked out as a charter pilot. I was flying this Baron with this other uh, senior pilot, and uh, it was my leg. And we got a lot into a lot of pretty good icing conditions, and we couldn't really see out the window other than we had this little plate on the window, which you could see this little hole. But even the plate was starting to ice up. Now we had the boots going and everything. Well, we're going out to Binghamton, New York, and we shot the approach. And the, the runway was pretty snowy, and <clears throat> we were getting ice, and the other pilot said, do you want to miss the approach and go back to, to uh, home base? I said, uh-uh. So when we landed, I had to actually look out the side window and cock the airplane to, you know, sort of uh, to look down the runway and then kick it out just at the very end because I had to go to the bathroom. That was my motivation for getting on the ground. So this can be a big distraction. Okay, we just mentioned John Denver. Um, this is a publicized fight. You probably all have your idea of what he did wrong. <clears throat> but, you know, he, he wasn't that familiar with this airplane. 
and he let go, had to let go of the controls to switch tanks because uh, he, he didn't put fuel on before he left and twist his head to the left to look behind, reach over his shoulder with his right hand, find the valve and turn it. Now the NTSB found out when you did this, you sort of braced your right foot on the right rudder pedal. Well, of course this is going to make the uh, airplane turn. He decided to do this 500 feet in the air or less. Why would you do this 500 feet in, in the air or less? Why wouldn't you do this at three or four thousand feet? Well, you, if you did lose it, you could, um, you know, you could recover. Think about it. Couldn't he set the fuel selector on the fullest tank or top the tanks off? What if? Did he ask, what if? What if I get up there and there's not enough fuel? Do I know how to do this? What if I don't have enough altitude to do this procedure? Have I done it before? How can I, can I, how much altitude did I lose, you know? Uh, what's so important to do close to the ground? You don't have to do this close to the ground. Get a little altitude. We get distracted. How many of us buzz the house or the beach? That's great, you know, if you can get away with it. But suppose your engine quits. Now you're in deep doo-doo. Uh, how many chat with passengers on final? Sterile cockpit. Professionalism, sterile cockpit. Absolutely don't. Don't chat with passengers on final because you're going to have a distraction. And if something happens, there's an emergency or something happens you know, on the runway or it's really turbulent, you could lose it. And same thing with takeoff. Do not chat on takeoff. Sterile cockpit to at least pattern altitude. And just remember, the ground of the water is not forgiving, so you have to make sure that if you're going to land on either, that you're in control. Flying's a learned skill, and just like all learned skills, you need to abide by the rules. And of course, airlines require sterile cockpits, and uh, single pilots should require sterile cockpits too. Keep quiet, focus on the task at hand, especially during critical phases of flight, which is close to the ground. It's discipline and not distraction. And this little picture we think uh, at the bottom here was from a tornado. We don't think they landed that way, but I thought it was kind of a cool picture anyway. Practice isn't everything. This uh, Cessna um, made two attempts to land in a really pretty good crosswind, a lot more than his capability. You know, three strikes you're out. Three, the third time he came in, weather cocked, went off into the cornfield and make a really good photo op. He should have said, what if? I've done it twice, it's not working out. Maybe I ought to go someplace else and land into the wind. And same thing with 737. These guys didn't remember how to take off in a crosswind. They lost it on takeoff. And they went into the field and caught fire. Everybody got out, but they to totally destroyed the airplane. Um, the wind was 290 degrees at 24 knots with gusting to 32, and it was created a strong left crosswind. Now, um, if it left uncorrected, it pushed the aircraft's tail to the right and nose to the left during the weather vane effect. This was just under the 737's maximum demonstrated crosswind component, and the NTSB discovered that it was pilot error. They never trained for the conditions. You know, these pilots, when you get in a big airplane like this, you know, you forget about crosswinds. You ought to go back and fly a, you know, 172 once in a while or a Cub and realize what you have to do to correct for this. They hadn't had that experience and they're just used to, you know, firewalling everything and just keeping on going. It's a heavy airplane, but they learned. What if? Ask yourself before you take off. What if this and this and this happens, what am I going to do so that on the, um, the pre-runway briefing to yourself, say what you're going to do in an emergency so it's no surprise. Now the moral to the story here is uh, admit to yourself conditions are not comfortable for your flying expertise and have the courage to change your course of action. A warning signs to pay attention to. Make sure that you don't end up being a statistic or having the NTSB knock on your door. Your gut tells you something's not right. Always trust your gut. If you're rushed, if the weather is iffy, if your passengers are pressuring you to go, these are things that are starting to accumulate. Your palms are sweaty while flying. It's no good when your palms are sweaty because that means you've already gotten in a situation that may be above your ability. So you have to ask yourself, what if, so you avoid getting in that situation. You've had more than one thing go wrong during the flight. 
most flights happen because of a, a series of errors. So if one or two things go wrong, get yourself on the ground and say, wait, we're going to think this through again. If you're tired, sick, stressed, hungover, or nervous, your pile, we talk about this in our human factors courses, um, you know, maybe you should think twice about flying because your brain isn't going to be operating functionally uh, at its peak and if you do have an emergency you're going to be, high, be behind the eight ball. You were in the kick the tires hopping and go mood? Not a car. This is an airplane, it can kill you really easy. So keep thinking about all this stuff, keep saying what if um, and hopefully that will help you train to keep your um, your emergency procedures fresh in your mind, your alternatives available to you, and you'll have a safe flight.